Hey y'all, Scott here. Have you seen something that looks like this? If you found that, that's me caring about the Nintendo 64. Please dispose of it immediately. I know, I'm putting these up and I just like the attention. Family photo. Oh god, that's embarrassing. That's better. The Nintendo 64, one of the most revolutionary consoles of all time, helped standardize how games in the third dimension look, play, and control, introduced so many genres, franchises, concepts, and I still don't give a shit. I'm being a bit harsh here. It's not that I don't like the Nintendo 64, I just don't care about it. This is not my favorite Nintendo console. It's not my least favorite, but this is one of the tougher ones to go back to for me. I totally understand its worth and why to many this is their favorite and I love so many of the things everybody else loves about this guy. But after I dug my grave, I decided to dig back into the system, look back at what gave it its groove, the games, the accessories, the innovation, the lack of Scott's sh giving. Everything that made the Nintendo 64, the Nintendo 64. I wanna learn to love this console because as it stands, it's all right. But that won't do. I have to appreciate everything Nintendo does for me. Criticism is just whining. Nintendo made buttons. What did you do, dad? Well, let's go back to the beginning here where everything precisely started, the mid nineties. Nintendo was king of the video game space. Their first two consoles, the Nintendo Entertainment System and Super Nintendo Entertainment System, both were at the top of the food chain in nearly every category. They had the best games, the best developers, the best sales. They were the video game company. There's a reason people would call any video game thing a uh, Nintendo. It's like, mom, this is a calculator. However, as time went on, more and more competition started appearing. And not only that, they weren't complete laughing stocks. Pretty much most consoles that fought against the original NES, there's a reason I dug this grave deeper than usual. But with the SNES, Sega brought the big guns with their Genesis and ended up taking a lot of market share away from Nintendo, even surpassing them for a brief moment. And when Nintendo was working to create a CD add-on for the Super Nintendo, they worked with Sony on it, but canceled plans after re-evaluating their contract. This made Sony so mad they created a worldwide phenomenon out of spite. Basically, Sega was legitimately scaring Nintendo and me, and Sony was a promising up and coming rival. They were burned by Nintendo and wanted to make their own video game console, and this isn't even covering the dozens of other companies that tried. Nintendo couldn't just sit there and expect everybody to only want Nintendo products. Sega customers proved that not everybody was born a Nintendo diehard. So, they had to get to work on a successor to the Super Nintendo, and near the end of the console's life, it was pretty obvious where the video game industry was heading. Downhill! F this console! 3D graphics and gameplay was the next big thing. Games like Donkey Kong Country and Star Fox gave us a taste as to how 3D can change how games look and play. Of course, cramming all of this onto a Super Nintendo cartridge, while possible, it felt more like they were shoehorning these types of games on the system. For Donkey Kong Country, they would create 3D models of these characters and recreate them in the form of a 2D SNES sprite. That was one way to get 3D looking games on your Super Nintendo, but what if you didn't have to do that? What if the game console could create 3D visuals right from the get-go? Well, Nintendo partnered with Silicon Graphics to do such a thing, announcing their collaboration on Project Reality in 1993. Yeah. Yeah, reality. At the time, these were the graphics dreams were made of. Like, the tech demos shown off weren't too far off from full-blown computer animation. By 1994, the official name of Project Reality was revealed, the Nintendo Ultra 64, Nintendo's next home console. I love adjectives and numbers, I'm sold. If you think game companies trying to push how powerful their consoles are now is a bit much, they made the defining feature of this console's name a tech spec. That's like Sony naming their next PlayStation the PlayStation GDDR6. 64 refers to how this console was 64 bits. Mom, don't you care? Bits were the hot ticket item back then. It all boiled down to how many bits does your console have? The NES only had eight, but the Genesis had 16, but the Super Nintendo had 16 as well, and the Sega Saturn and PlayStation were 32, but just for good measure, Nintendo skipped all the way over to 64. Technically, Nintendo had a 32-bit system at the time, the Virtual Boy, and even that had the code name of VR32, showing how important bits were to marketing back then. I guarantee you, nobody who actively argued about how many bits their console was even knew what bits were. Hell, I don't even know, and I'm complaining about it. All people knew was, the higher the number, the good or the fun. And Nintendo wanted to flaunt just how powerful their system was by lodging a number that meant absolutely nothing to anybody prior into their console's name. But they just couldn't help themselves and threw an ultra in there as well. A couple months later in 94, the console design was revealed. And it's functional. I have no idea what this looks like with its little feet and hourglass figure. The cartridge designs were also shown off here with the most prominent feature being the fact they exist. This right here. 
may have been one of Nintendo's biggest mistakes. By 1994, it was pretty obvious that CDs were the future of video games. They could store so much content, video and audio clips at great quality, and they were so cheap to produce. The Ultra 64 cartridges could barely hold anything in comparison, could barely hold video and audio clips, and if they could, they were severely compressed and downgraded and cost a mortgage to produce. But they were harder to pirate and had faster load times. That makes them better. And ever since that decision, Nintendo's always been number one, two, three, one. Wii U. The Ultra 64 was consistently talked about for years, with a release by holiday 1995 planned. Eventually, they renamed it to just straight up Nintendo 64, which, yeah, Nintendo Ultra 64, you only really need one of those. But even with the name and console design finalized, Nintendo delayed the system a good handful of times until finally nailing a release in June 1996 in Japan, September 1996 in North America, and March 1997 everywhere else. Four years after it was announced. Yeah, this console took a while to actually exist. And that was unfortunate because Sega and Sony had a two-year head start. Their consoles released in 1994, but they weren't Nintendo. They were dog sh Nintendo was fine with delaying their console and choosing to only use cartridges because they felt that people would choose to wait for an N64 instead of just buying a PlayStation. They sure didn't. To be fair, the Nintendo 64 sold incredibly well throughout its launch window, doing better than the competition for a brief moment. But then, it happened. Nothing. The Nintendo 64 had numerous software droughts. Nintendo just couldn't pump games out fast enough for the system. Games were becoming harder to develop. This was the first generation where 3D was the norm, so it was understandable development times may have been longer. But see, that's where the other developers come in. When Nintendo's not releasing games, surely the third parties can fill the void. And we return to one of Nintendo's greatest mistakes. See, the Sega Saturn and PlayStation may have only been stinky-ass 32-bit systems, but they used CDs for their games. That meant the games would cost less and store far more information. And with these systems having a two-year head start on the N64, developers got used to having all that leg room. A standard PlayStation disc could fit roughly 700 megabytes of all kinds of stuff. A Nintendo 64 cartridge, at the most, could fit 64 megabytes. And even then, a game that used a 64 megabyte cartridge cost your soul to buy. So, to third-party developers, would you rather develop for a system that's been out for two years with a good install base that uses CDs so you can make bigger games with not as many limitations, or would you rather fuck with Mario? So, yeah, the Nintendo 64 had third-party support, but not a lot of it. The biggest third-party games that released that generation, there was a really good chance they did not come out on Nintendo 64. Not only was Nintendo's output of software a bit lower than usual, but the amount of third-party software was just not up to snuff with the competition. When Nintendo wasn't releasing a new game, there really wasn't anything else to play. But I mean, when there was stuff to play, there was stuff to play. People loved their N64s, and while the PlayStation sold over 100 million units, with the Nintendo 64 coming in a distant second place with 32 million, it did better than the Sega Saturn. But that's something everybody can say about themselves. I think the lack of third-party support in some way made it so the people who owned a 64 felt a deeper connection to it than the PS1. And that console kind of felt like the console people would just buy by default. Yeah, it has the most games, it plays music CDs, I'll go with this one. If you wanted an N64, you wanted an N64. You were willing to look past the issues because you really wanted to play the games. I just always see more people passionately talking about the Nintendo 64 in comparison to the PS1. And while these are both two systems beloved by many, I feel like if you take 10 different people who owned a PlayStation, each of them probably don't have a ton in common. There were so many games on that system, there's a chance everybody played different PS1 games growing up. If you take 10 N64 owners, they all played Super Mario 64, Mario Kart 64, GoldenEye, Ocarina of Time. Not saying that's a good or bad thing, but I feel like the lack of a ton of software on Nintendo 64 in some ways helped bring more Nintendo fans together. That's almost the weirdly beautiful thing about a console that didn't do that well. The Wii U era was pretty tart, but I felt there was this cool connection I had with other Wii U owners. It was called a mutual hatred. So this is the Nintendo 64, originally launching for $199 with no pack-in game initially. Thank god, I'm allergic to deals. It was pretty much tradition for Nintendo to include a game with the console up to this point, but they decided to forgo that with the N64. Again, comparing the PS1 to the system, PlayStation just comes out on top here. You buy an N64 with no game, it's completely worthless out of the box. At least with the PlayStation, you could play music CDs on it, which gave it some value without a game. What are you gonna do with an N64? Take it for a walk? The system itself was standardized across the world. The name and design were the same in all regions, so we all said at the same time, What, what the, the f is, is this? this? This is such a silly looking console. It doesn't look bad by any means, it's just 
Kind of odd. But it's not full-blown odd. It looks basic and strange at the same time. However, this design gave way to some incredible colors and special editions. There were so many variants out there. This is one of the first big consoles to really push different colors. But of course, the charcoal color was the de facto, coming with a great... Spider? Oh look, it's time to be confused about the Nintendo 64 controller. D what the hell? Of course, with the system being so focused on delivering three-dimensional experiences, a simple eight-way directional pad wasn't gonna do. We needed full 360-degree movement, so here's an old friend I wouldn't trust with my life. The analog stick, a tiny little joystick made for one thumb in all the directions in the world. Outside of this edition, most of the controller is fairly typical. The buttons and D-pad all feel fine, and while the layout is odd, it's functional. Three grips is just flat out bizarre. Bizarre, though. There's no right or wrong way to hold this thing, though there's really no Nintendo 64 game out there that would ask you to use the D-pad if you're already using the stick and A and B buttons. For 3D games, you hold the middle prong and right prong. For 2D games, left prong and right prong. For weird ass games, left prong and middle prong. There's a trigger on the back of the middle prong here, these new C buttons, and a port for all kinds of activities. It's not a terrible controller. It's just not great. The stick is sort of garbage feeling, and sure, no game asks you to have access to all these buttons at once, but isn't it weird that this controller makes sure you can't access all these buttons at once? Like, is there any good reason why if you design your game around using the analog stick and A and B buttons, you just can't use the D-pad or L button? Regardless of my problems with it, the Nintendo 64 controller deserves respect after a shunning, but incorporating the analog stick helped innovate games so hard. And we can't ignore the fact you could use four of them on a console, no problem. Four player multiplayer. That was another one of the Nintendo 64's claims to fame. Most consoles will only have two controller ports and you would have to grab an accessory to up it to four. Because of that, not many games in general supported more than two players, but the N64 really pushed for more people playing at once. It was the only console that generation to have four controller ports, which really helped it stick out. And just like the console, the controllers came in so many fun colors. Do I like this thing or not? Well, we gotta move on to the games and... <laughs> Nintendo, the least you could have done when moving strictly to cartridges for the system was give them labels. I had to resort to buying fan-made ones on Etsy and they're pretty fun. It makes it exciting when you buy a new 64 game. Like, oh, I get to use another sticker. Even with the labels, the way these things are shaped make them kind of a pain to store. Anyways, the Nintendo 64 launched with games here in North America, and two of them at that. Japan had it way better. They got three games. Alongside the system's release, Super Mario 64 and Pilot Wing 64 came out. That was it. If you were living in Japan, you had the choice of buying Saikyo Habu Shogi as well, which meant you were either buying Mario 64 or Pilot Wings. Super Mario 64 was the flagship title. The reason you wanted to buy a Nintendo 64 if Pilot Wings was sold out. Popping this cartridge in and turning it on. It's me, Mario. Hello! Oh my god, he has a face? This right here helped show just how powerful the Nintendo 64 was, and this isn't even the game. Mario's smooth facial animations, the high quality model, being able to manipulate his face to be whatever you want, this was an ingenious title screen, and it's completely superfluous. It has nothing to do with the rest of the game. But it's here to show something that could not have been done on prior hardware, and it's just for fun. The game itself, I mean, what else is there to say? I mean, it's no Pilewing 64, but it has its charm. Mario 64, may just be one of the greatest launch titles in history, not only showing why the N64 mattered, but what video games could be. 3D gaming was nothing new by the time this thing finally came out, but Mario 64 was the first to truly nail it. Having this controllable camera system and these wide open worlds to explore and jump around in. Half the fun in Mario 64 is just running, jumping, doing whatever. Wasting time. Some of my favorite memories with this game had nothing to do with completing the objectives. It was exploring Peach's castle, both on the outside and the inside. It was falling into a new level and just jumping about, doing all these fun tricks. This was the perfect selling point for 3D gaming, showing how it wasn't a gimmick. It wasn't about graphics, it wasn't about just looking more and more realistic. 3D worlds are so much more immersive and the kind of fun I have in Mario 64 just roaming around exploring, it couldn't be done in 2D. There were so many more variables here that let the player be creative. You don't just go left or right, you have 360 different directions you can go in. While there were objectives to complete and the actual game was incredibly fun and replayable, Mario 64 gave you the tools to make your own fun alongside it. As a kid, it was a blast using my imagination with this game, coming up with crazy things to do or just not do anything at all, just enjoying being in this world. This will always be one of the greatest video games of all time. 
one of. Pilot Wing 64, a sequel to Pilot Wings, a launch title for the Super Nintendo. You know, it made sense to make this a launch title for the 64, as the original Pilot Wings was showing how the SNES could sort of kind of do pseudo 3D stuff. Now with 64, we have the real deal. There's not a ton to this one, different missions to complete with different flight vehicles. It's fairly basic, but a lot of the fun comes from just flying around. It's enjoyable to just hover over these environments, and just like with Mario 64, it's fun to stray from the core objective and make your own fun. This launch was very quality over quantity oriented, which I guess was Nintendo's mentality throughout the 64's life. Less than 300 games were released here in North America, with less than 400 overall worldwide. That's still a decent number of games, but comparing that to pretty much any other major console, it's like, Man, what's going on here? Nintendo consistently had issues with game output, delaying games quite a bit, especially in 1997. Look at this lineup. These were the only games Nintendo published for the 64 in 1997. None of these are bad games, but when Tetrisphere is 17% of your game output, something's f***y. And when we take a look at what Sony was publishing on the PlayStation in 97, yeah, issue alert. I mean, but when Nintendo released a good game, they released a good game. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time was what many people were looking forward to, and it was basically another Mario 64 in terms of impact. Gone was the top-down perspective of 2D Zelda, and in came a third-person viewpoint in a 3D world. The added dimension really helped to push the character, story, and universe of Ocarina of Time. It truly felt like you were on an adventure, and these characters were actual people. Ocarina revolutionized what adventure games were, and is still considered one of, if not the greatest game of all time. We're three for three here. Not only did we get one Zelda game, but two Zelda games for the system. Crazy considering not many games came out on the N64, but we ended up getting two games in a series notorious for long wait times between entries. The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask was a very smart sequel, reusing assets in the foundation of Ocarina of Time and making something fairly unique in comparison. Doomsday is inevitable, and you have to do your general Zelda stuff before the time limit runs up, but you can manipulate time to your advantage. This alongside the far darker tone is what makes this game really stand out, and while it doesn't appeal to everybody, it definitely has a huge fan base, and hey, we got two fully 3D Zelda titles on the same system, that's not a bad deal. Majora did require the expansion pack though, an accessory for the people who care too much. See, there's this door on the console, we remove it, and oh man, how could I forget to mention the jumper pack, my favorite! This comes standard with the console, and you need it inserted to have anything work, but we can remove it and replace it with an expansion pack for maximum better? Only two games straight up required it as it gave the N64 more RAM to work with, Majora's Mask and Donkey Kong 64. Perfect Dark sort of needed it, but you could kind of play some parts of it without an expansion pack. A handful of games supported the accessory, but it was not required by any means for most. Hell, Donkey Kong 64 barely even required it. The only reason it needed it was to fix a game-breaking bug the developers had no idea how to fix otherwise. The only solution was to make the expansion pack mandatory, so it was bundled in with the game. Oh, <laughs> Donkey Kong 64. It was really cool to see all these game series make the jump to 3D, even if it was Donkey Kong 64. This is a bloated mess of a game. I mean, overall it's all right, but man, there are just too many any collectibles. But hey, Donkey Kong in 3D, that's pretty neat. It was cool seeing these characters and worlds from a brand new perspective. And we have none other than Rare to thank for that, one of the definitive developers of the Nintendo 64. For sure, they worked on the Donkey Kong Country games, but the N64 was where they really hit their stride. I have no idea how they were able to pump out so many good games in such a small amount of time. Like, three of the six Nintendo 64 games Nintendo published in 1997 were developed by Rare. While they weren't owned by Nintendo, they had a strong part partnership with them at this time, leading to games like Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie, 3D platformers not unlike Mario 64, but with their own flavor and spin. Conker's Bad Fur Day, a 3D platformer definitely unlike Mario 64, playing around with the concept of looking like a cutesy family-friendly game when in reality being not a church. And my god, they really knew how to use this hardware. Conker specifically included just a ton of voice acting and cutscenes, which was hard to do on this system. You have some quirky one-offs like Blast Corps, all about vandalism, Jet Force Gemini, Mickey Speedway USA, Killer Instinct Gold, oh my god. For sure, not all these games were 100% winners, but at the very least, they were fairly quality titles for the time. But then they decided to squirt out GoldenEye 007, a landmark game in history. We're 4 for 4. How the hell did this even happen? A movie licensed game that came out two years after the movie ended up being a landmark title on home consoles, revolutionizing the first person shooter, including one of the most cherished multiplayer modes of all time. It's definitely hard to go back to now, but you can always appreciate what it did for gaming and how amazing this was 
was back in 97. Somehow, Nintendo had the James Bond license for video games at the time, and they definitely made the most of it. They made two games, but one of them was GoldenEye. When the license went to Electronic Arts, Rare wanted to make a spiritual successor to GoldenEye, and ended up both developing and publishing Perfect Dark in 2000. Again, similar to GoldenEye, I went at the thought of going back to it today, but back then, yeah, this was good and stuff. It pretty much used every aspect of the N64 it could have, included the transfer pack accessory. You plug this into the controller and you can pop certain Game Boy and Game Boy Color games in to have home console and handheld games interact. I love stupid junk like this. Not a ton of games supported it, but the one game that mattered did, Pokemon Stadium. The Nintendo 64 released during the big Pokemon boom when the craze just started to happen worldwide. So Nintendo acted upon that. They had crazy successful Pokemon games on the Game Boy and Game Boy Color. Let's make some Nintendo 64 Pokemon spin-offs. Yeah, Pokemon Stadium is like taking a standard Pokemon game with the adventure and battles, putting it in 3D and taking out the adventure. You're just left with the battles with not much substance, of course. Back then, that was pretty cool to see your favorite Pokemon in 3D, just like how it was cool for me to see my favorite Donkey Kong. And you could transfer your very own Pokemon from the Game Boy games into Stadium, plus play the Game Boy games on the TV with the transfer pack. You couldn't really play any other Game Boy games on the TV with the N64. Just Pokemon. See, Nintendo let you play any Game Boy game on your Super Nintendo with the Super Game Boy. Why they made an accessory like this that let you only play one Game Boy game and nothing else, I don't know. But all Pokemon Stadium games supported the transfer pack. Pokemon Stadium 1, which only released in Japan. Pokemon Stadium 1, which was Pokemon Stadium 2 in Japan. And Pokemon Stadium 2, which was Pokemon Stadium Gold and Silver in Japan. Never liked Logic. There was AU Pikachu, which used the voice recognition unit, don't you? It doesn't. Pokemon Puzzle League, which was just a Pokemon-themed version of Tetris Attack, which makes it my favorite Pokemon game. And Pokemon Snap, an on-rails photography game. Try to get as good Pokemon shots as possible. This was the best non-puzzle Pokemon game on the system. I understand that the developers behind Pokemon strongly believed that the Game Boy was the best platform for the series at the time, but I'm just surprised Nintendo didn't straight up force them to make a true N64 Pokemon adventure. That really would have been the kick in the pants the system needed. But I mean, it still had some of the best-selling games that generation. Mario Kart 64 came out a few months after the system's launch, and this is the big one. Easily one of my favorite Mario Karts nostalgia-wise. I don't know what it was, but my memories of this game are better than any other game in the series. The tracks, the multiplayer, the items, the battle mode, it was all the best. Playing it now? That's fine. I mean, playing with friends, any Mario Kart's gonna be a blast, but just looking at the core game, the core controls, it's not as good as I remember. At least we have Diddy Kong Racing. This was the big holiday title for 1997. When Mario Kart released earlier that year, yeah, that was really needed. But in many ways, this is better than Mario Kart 64. The characters are actual full 3D models, while in Mario Kart, they're all flat. There's an adventure mode, bosses, more characters developed by Rare. Again, how did they do this like three months after GoldenEye? And there were so many other racing games. F-Zero X, sequel to the SNES launch title. You know, with that one, you had to take the word for it where you were and truly how fast you were going. Here, you get the full F-Zero experience. It is blisteringly fast. Wave Race 64 and 10 80 snowboarding, the extreme sports racing games by Nintendo, but loads of fun, and they even brought back Excite Bike with Excite Bike 64. Of course, these racing games may not have been the most deep experiences out there in comparison to games like Final Fantasy VII and Metal Gear Solid on the PS1, but they were fun multiplayer experiences, and that is what made the N64 stand out. So many of Nintendo's flagship games on this console were multiplayer oriented, even if they held from a series that used to be single player only. F Zero X introduced multiplayer, and so did Star Fox 64. And Star Fox 64 was a huge release, basically acting as a retelling of Star Fox on the Super Nintendo. But now on a system that isn't choking on its graphics. And the initial release included the Rumble Pack. Now, this is big. Plug it into your controller, pop some batteries in, and what happens in the game affects your controller. It really added to the experience and made big moments feel that much bigger. I'm surprised Nintendo never updated the N64 controller to have the Rumble feature built in. So many games supported it, way more than any other 64 accessory except the memory cards, but even then, most of the games I cared about just saved directly to the cartridge, so oops, I don't own one. Yeah, I have a will to live, but not a 64 memory card. Something's not right. Anyways, yeah, multiplayer was a big part of the Nintendo 64's identity. I immediately think of party games instead of huge, sprawling adventures when the console comes up. And to be fair, I think we can credit it with the birth of the modern party genre. Mario Party was introduced on this console and appeared three times. A virtual board game where mini games are played after everybody takes a turn moving, fun occurs, bullshit's inevitable. Listen, 
I can go on and on about these games. And well, yes, they are the most balanced, they are the most well thought out, amazing games out there. And they're super fun with friends. So much garbage happens. These are great, kick back on the couch, half pay attention kind of games. But when it's time to take them seriously, it's time to really take them seriously. Well, I think Mario Party 2 is the most well rounded of the three. I have a soft spot for the first one. Literally. There are multiple mini games in the first entry that require spinning the analog stick, and the most effective way to do so is to use your palm. Why wouldn't Nintendo get sued? So, if you complained for a brief time, Nintendo would send you gloves free of charge and quickly put out Mario Party 2 with less hand altering action to avoid further action. But hey, if you wanted something a bit more traditional, Mario's sports games started to make their mark on the 64. They were always a thing, but truly became their own here. Golf and tennis were great entries, and they even supported the transfer pack, communicating with the Game Boy Color versions. And then Dr. Mario 64 came out, and it was the last Nintendo published N64 game here in North America, and you'd think they'd put a lot of time and effort into it. Uh, th this is just Dr. Mario. I mean, it has four players, which is cool, but for the last Nintendo 64 game made by Nintendo a few months before the GameCube was releasing, I, I don't know, this looks kind of stinky. Kirby 64 The Crystal Shards was another late N64 release, and it looks really impressive. It's still a 2D game, but with consistently changing camera angles. The colors and models look so nice, and plus you can inhale an enemy, obtain their power, and mix and match it with another enemy's power. It's cool, all right, moving on. Even though Kirby was a 2D platformer, there wasn't a ton of them on here. I'm sure there was Yoshi's Story, a successor to Yoshi's Island. Not as good, but an interesting follow-up. Most games were just straight up 3D, which, like, obviously, why wouldn't they be? That was half the appeal of the system. Games were in 3D now. But looking over at the PlayStation and Sega Saturn, they knew 2D games still had appeal. They weren't worse than 3D games, they were just different. So those systems had a pretty good mix of 2D and 3D games, while the 64 primarily focused on just 3D. That isn't terrible or anything. I mean, there were still 2D games here, with one of the most prominent being... Yes, the first entry in the Nintendo crossover fighting series. Super Smash Brothers appeared on the Nintendo 64. Look at this, this is adorably tiny. Who would have thought this game featuring 12 Nintendo characters would kaboom into this? Four player mayhem, a cross between a fighting game and a party game. This is the Nintendo 64 doing what it does best. Mario 64 and Ocarina of Time may be some of the best games out there, but Smash Brothers is really what the Nintendo 64 was at its core, the fun machine. They had Paper Mario too. But that's pretty much everything Nintendo made on the system. Sure, there were some Japan exclusives. Animal Crossing got its start here. Like super late, it came out a week after Dr. Mario 64 and was the last overall Nintendo published game on the system, but it happened. Sin and Punishment and Custom Robo appeared only in Japan, but that's pretty much it. So I think it's time to discuss not what appeared on the Nintendo 64, but what didn't appear. No Metroid game, no Fire Emblem game, that was a little odd. Third party support was incredibly minimal. Sure, the system got a few games here and there, but Squaresoft, the makers of Final Fantasy, they originally were planning to support the system just like any of Nintendo's previous consoles, but decided to go with PlayStation because of those sweet, sweet discs. They didn't publish, anything on Nintendo 64. And then the other big guys, Capcom, Konami, they made a few things, but not nearly as much as they did on PlayStation. Sometimes the 64 would get table scraps from the PS1, like Mega Man 64. It's just Mega Man Legends from the PS1, a spin-off adventure game. Why not just call it Mega Man Legends? Calling it Mega Man 64 implies this is the definitive Mega Man Nintendo 64 experience, not a port of a PS1 adventure game spin-off of a platforming series. Also, Let's discuss the 64 name. My god, why did every other game have to have 64 in their title? It just wasn't consistent. Why did Mario get it but not Zelda? Why did Donkey Kong get it but not F-Zero? Why did Mario Kart get it but not Mario Tennis? Pilot Wings but not Yoshi? It was just weird what Nintendo considered deserving of an actual subtitle and what wasn't deserving. It almost felt like they were saying, yeah, this is just the Nintendo 64 version of the series and nothing more, keep walking. And a lot of other companies outside of Nintendo did this and in my opinion, it made things somewhat confusing. Like Mega Man 64 is a port of a PS1 game not called Called that, but Doom 64 is a completely brand new original game. At that point, why not call Resident Evil 2 on the Nintendo 64 Resident Evil 64? This was another Capcom game, the second one of three, the third being Magical Tetris Challenge. This is all they did on N64. But Resident Evil 2 is wildly impressive. This was a two disc PS1 game and they crammed the whole thing on a cartridge with not nearly as many compromises as you'd expect. 
this is crazy. It's unfortunate not a lot of other games like this reported, but to be fair, this was a miracle that happened in the first place. Konami was more prominent on the system, though that's really only because they were publishing a lot of sports games at the time. They made two unique 3D Castlevanias, I don't like them. I mean, they made Symphony of the Night for the PlayStation and Sega Saturn in Japan. This was a refined 2D experience. The Castlevania 64 games are wet and muddy and just feel so lonely and not fun and I'm sad. Nintendo 64 games in general just don't look that great. They look so muddy and blurry if you're playing on an original console. Playing anywhere else, like on the Wii Virtual Console or something, they're a bit cleaner, but still, the, this era just doesn't age very well at all. The N64 didn't get a lot of other games. Third parties primarily would put over family games, sports games, some 3D platformers, every now and then some exclusives would appear, like the Turok series, but there were barely any RPGs. Now, for somebody like me, Thank God! Oh, come on, basically there were only three RPGs on the entire system. Quest 64, which the only reason this game exists was to be one of the only RPGs on the system, Ogre Battle 64, and Paper Mario. This was mainly a 3D platforming adventure game and party game machine. It did those things very well, but it wasn't a great all-in-one console. Which, to fix that issue, Nintendo released the 64DD add-on, I think. This was announced before the system even came out. Great, an add-on for a system that's not even close to releasing. I'm so excited to buy two things. This is actually just straight up called the 64DD, not the Nintendo 64DD. And these are incredibly rare and expensive. You'd have to be a f***ing idiot to own one of them. While it was announced in 1995, it released in 1999. It was created to avoid the storage limitations of the N64 cartridges by using magnetic discs. It barely Really helped. Like, N64 cartridges at their max could store 64 megabytes of stuff. These discs were 64 megabytes standard. So, like, CDs were around 700 megabytes. Why even try to release this? It could do all kinds of things. It had an internal clock. It could connect online. It failed miserably. Only a couple games released for the thing. It only came out in Japan, sold like ass, was delayed several times, and by the time it came out, it was worthless. The Sega Dreamcast already released. The PlayStation 2 was announced. I feel like Nintendo wasted so much of their time with this thing. Dozens upon dozens of games were planned for the DD, eventually getting cancelled. Without it, I'm sure we would have gotten way more N64 games. All these games that were being worked on for the 64 DD, they ended up saying, well, let's either turn them into N64 cartridge games or wait to release them on better hardware. And that just left the Nintendo 64 with Dr. Mario 64 being the last game Nintendo made for the system. What a way to piss out. Yeah, I think this deserves a discussion on its own. If I ever own one. But that was the Nintendo 64, and overall, it's a pretty good system. Though, no matter how I look at it, I'm always going to see a troubled console that didn't live up to what Nintendo wanted out of it. For every one thing Nintendo innovated with this console, there was another that was ridiculously closed-minded and stuck in the past. And while I respect it for being such a landmark console with such amazing games like Mario 64 and Ocarina of Time, I just feel like out of the 400 so games that released for it, there's only like 40 of them that are well worth playing today, and only 20 of those 40 have aged well. But the good games for the system were really good games. It nailed multiplayer, and no matter what, there will always be a reason to fire this system back up. It may not be my favorite Nintendo system, but I care about it. I found it!